My guest today is Kenneth P. Green. What I do basically is, is um, I criticize public policy uh, in the areas of environmental health and safety. And I've done that uh, for think tanks in North America now since 1994. Um, prior to that, uh, uh, which makes me something of a rare animal in the think tank world, I trained in the sciences. So I have a bachelor's degree in biology from UCLA. My master's is in molecular genetics from San Diego State. My doctorate's in environmental science, again, from UCLA. Um, but along the way, the more I learned about uh, biology and environmental science, uh, and the more I became politically aware of what was happening in the world, the more I realized uh, there was a huge disjunction between the policies that I was seeing that ostensibly were going to be about helping the environment and protecting human health, uh, and um, the underlying actual science that I had been trained in. And so uh, that's what led me more to, instead of staying in the laboratory where I spent my uh, enough years, that led me out to the world of writing about uh, public policy and environmental health and safety. Um, I've done that ever since. Like I said, I've worked on um, subjects from starting with air pollution, which is what my doctoral degree was on. I was in the air pollution policy, so I moved into air pollution first, then spread out into climate policy uh, with uh, tendrils as it does driving down into electric vehicle policy, renewable energy kind of policies, um, all of the all of the subsidiary things that we associate with climate and energy policy, um, uh, and and to a certain extent chemical chemical exposures and risk studies, uh, and I've, I've basically been a critic of the way those policies are implemented now, um, for going on uh, frankly enough thirty years. All right, and you came from uh, a point where you were concerned about real environmental pollution, right? I think you had a childhood asthma problem, maybe caused by. Oh, absolutely. I, I, um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley uh, of California, the smoggy San Fernando Valley, um, which uh, is most famous for the origins of Valley Talk, uh, the Frank Zappa, Moon Unit Zappa song, Valley Talk. Um, that's how they spoke in my junior high school and high school. Uh, but equally famous is the fact that the air was so dense um, that Johnny Carson used to joke that, that once he, uh, he lived in, in Burbank uh, and in Los Angeles, that he could never travel uh, when he traveled outside of Los Angeles. He never <clears throat> he could never trust the air because he couldn't see it. And um, uh, that was the case where I grew up. The Santa Rana Valley summers were just a um, uh, air pollution nightmare. Back then, when we had when when they said you have a smog alert, um, you didn't have to look at your cell phone. You didn't have one, but you didn't have to actually look at the television or whatever to know. You could open the window and you could look out and you could actually see the brown haze in the air. That made it impossible for you to read the neighbor's number sign on their door across the street, right? You couldn't actually read the number of, uh, of the house sign across across the street or a street sign halfway down the block. You just couldn't read it. Um, and and so when I was about uh, 14 years old or so, 13, 14, I was running track as they did. And they made us do in those days that coercive physical education stuff, push-ups, sit-ups, right? Climbing ropes, running the 600, the, the dreaded 600. Um, uh, out on the asphalt running track behind school. Uh, and um, it, was, it was late spring, early summer. I uh, got about halfway through and my lungs uh, completely locked up to the point that I, I couldn't breathe. I sounded like a, a steam whistle on a train uh, collapsed uh, at about uh, 400 yards on the track um, and uh, had me hauled off and was, uh, was tested for uh, asthma, which... Um, uh, clearly, I had uh, in spades, and um, uh, I've, ca I had, I've carried inhalers with me for the rest of my life, and I still do. Um, and um, a large part of that, my mother was also asthmatic and was very unhealthy. Um, and a large part of that actually is um, what drove us to out to the desert for recreation, uh, which is where I'm living today, other than in Perup, outside of Las Vegas, because the, the de desert air, we could get outside of Los Angeles 40 minutes, to fit a minute, an hour to the Mojave Desert where the air was crystal clear and there was no uh, air pollution and my mother could breathe uh, and I could breathe. And so we, uh, that, that's where we, 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 I was drawn to the, to the desert. Uh, and in the desert, I was drawn to biology because I, I was fascinated with the, uh, the, the my earliest biological, biological fascination was the adaptations that animals and plants make to living in the desert in this unbelievably... Uh, harsh, but uh, I think extremely beautiful uh, environment, and that led me into biology and led me into um, 
environmental science where I wanted to combine those two. I wanted to actually, what my master's and doctorate were looking at was, um, was towards using biological engineering to make uh, organisms to clean up pollution. That's originally where I was going to go with my master's degree and afterward. Um, but as I said, along the way, uh, I realized that so much of what was being pushed in environmental policy was actually not only wrong, but doing harm to people and more harm than good. Uh, and that led me into being more of a critic and less of a, a bioengineer, biological engineer. All right. And then that, in your book, you said that sometimes reading the news, it seems like we are drowning in a sea of risks. Is that something you saw pretty early on is that there's so many people selling so many risks to us? Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely. I, I, from an early age, it's one of the things where, where what got my attention is it's, it's, a, it's a, perhaps a perversity and perhaps a character flaw. Uh, perhaps I never got past that stage of being a child and say, and asking the question of, of why, you know, how kids say to their dad, their parents, why? Why? For me, it was always, um, how do you know that? How, how, why do you say that? And how do you know that is it the question that I, I would get I, early on when people would tell me, uh, in my case, I'd go to the doctors and the doctor would say, I was, cause I was already, I gained weight when I was like nine years old and the doctors would hand me, uh, diets and they clear, they clearly weren't, weren't, wouldn't work, whatever. And I'd say, so where, where did this come from? How do you know this? And the, generally speaking, the doctor would just, would, would met, as they did in the day, was just blow you off and say, this is the doc, this is the diet. The American you know, Health Association says this is the diet. Uh, but I would dig, you know, I would look at it, look for it. And I was like, well, why do you say that? And often what I came up, what I found is we say that because someone has a model of how things work as opposed to actually having measured how things really work, right? So there's really, there's two kinds of science or modeling um, in the world. There's deterministic modeling where you know all of the variables and you know how they relate to each other in a way and they can't relate any other way. They're based on physical law, right? They can't go the other way. And so you can draw a chain of cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. And you can make a model of how things work such that you know reliably every single time if you pull thread here, it's connected to and it will pull move thread, right? move thing here. Um, and, and those are deterministic models. And that to me is actual science. That's the real, those kind of models are real science or engineering based models, as opposed to speculative models where you say, if this happens and we assume this and we assume this and we assume this connection, if this happens and then this happens and then this happens and this happens, we get here. And those are the kind of models that people you were seeing in the headline, which is, um, if you eat, and the, the earliest ones were, right? If you eat a high fat diet, you have a 12% increased risk of having a heart attack. Or if you consume, if you breathe secondhand smoke from cigarettes, my mother was a heavy smoker, gave me asthma attacks all the time. But um, if you breathe secondhand smoke, you have an X percent increased risk of having asthma attacks or developing, can developing cancer, uh, et cetera. Um, and it was looking at those models and, and this same thing. If your cholesterol level is, is this, this high, you have an X percent probability of having a heart attack, higher probability of having a heart attack. Uh, and so you should take this drug and with the drug, it'll reduce your risk. It'll reduce your cholesterol and theoretically then reduce your risk. But when you look at all of those things, they all rely on assumption-based models, which is uh, they're, not, they're not the kind of deterministic model you would use to to rely on when you got on an airplane to know it would work. They're much more subjective and more, more assumption filled than that. And, and I found that these models run through all of the subjects I talked about that I, that, that I, I have worked on over the years from air pollution to protecting the ozone layer, to counting species loss, to counting, uh, figuring out how many uh, claims we're losing polar bears, right? The polar bears are all dying. Um, to uh, climate change models, the models that the, the Earth is, is heating at a certain rate and greenhouse gases are causing the, the heating at a certain rate. Uh, these are all models that start uh, with assumptions play, put in uh, and generate a range of outputs that are speculation. The problem is regulators started in the 1970s, and I talk about this in the book, started using the output of these models, speculative models, as if they were actually evidence of reality. 
as if they really reflected physical reality uh, when, when in fact they don't. They're probable, they're guesses, they're probabilities, right? Um, and so in the 1970s, when they were looking at air pollution standards, they started out with studies of kids of people like me. They had gross level asthma attacks. There were people who died. They did autopsies. They looked at their lungs. They could see there was air pollution. They're, they're coating their lungs or cigarette smoke co coating their lungs, right? Um, they were la laboratory studies of mortality and, and sickness and, and morbidity. Um, but they quickly ran out of those and starting in the 1970s because they were trying to chase ever smaller amounts of risk. And it became more prohibitive and difficult to do because you need bigger and bigger samples of people. So they, just, they sort of hit the wall on those. But fortuitously for the regulators, the 1970s gave us, uh, and may Bill Gates ever be cursed, um, Excel and spreadsheets and computer modeling made it cheap and easy for lots of people to grind models to computers. Uh, and soon we had epidemiology models and risk models and exposure models uh, that took the place of actual evidence, evidence-based models, evidence-based um, findings or analysis of harms, environmental harms, air pollution harms, harms through reduced ozone at the stratospheric ozone, harms because of climate change, changes because of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's been basically models ever since the 1970s. Uh, it radiated out through every element of environment, health, and safety policy and regulation. And that's why I call it the plague of models is because um, it, has, it has penetrated to all corners of what we now think about in terms of the regulation of risk in environment, health, and safety. Um, and it has disconnected those policies from reality, uh, leading many, many cases to adverse uh, consequences, to negative, negative consequences to the very systems it claims to protect. Well, let's see, you said in your book, what did you say? Oh, before people had uh, these wonderful computers to use, maybe they put a lot more thought into reality before they decided to try to model reality. But right now it's so easy to just really, without thinking, you can just construct a model and it's so easy to tweak stuff that there's less thinking, more computing. Do you agree with that? Well, yes. It is, it's, yeah. First of all, it's much cheaper. It's way cheaper. It's way faster. Uh, you know, uh, a guy, some grad students uh, with, with computers, typing away on computers in a, in a nice set, a nice clean computer lab is a lot cheaper than having a, an army of graduate students performing chemistry experiments in chemical chemistry laboratories and biological experiments in with animals, huge uh, vast numbers of rats and mice uh, in biology laboratories and toxicology laboratories. Uh, it's, it's much cheaper and easier and much faster. Um, it's much more related to the regulatory cycle as well, because you can make your models sync up with your regulatory cycle. If it's five years to reinspect the air pollution standards, well, you can make your models evolve them within that five-year cycle. And the thing about them, since they're not based on reality, unlike laboratory studies, is they virtually never come out and say the previous ones were wrong, which we see a lot in actual experimental-based uh, science. In fact, the, the, the rates of retraction for studies now, it's a giant um, scandal, really. How many stu studies are being proven to be wrong? John Ioannidis, I believe it is, published a study at one point about 10, 15 years ago, basically saying that why, all, why virtually every study is wrong uh, is because they're provisional data and additional studies give you more resolving power, but you keep checking the previous studies against reality. And the part with models is you never get to the point where you check them against reality. So the models used, for example, people say, well, we went to the moon. It's like, those were models. Yeah, they were models of where the moon would be, where we were, the velocity of the different things. They were very big, well, very complicated models, physics models. Uh, nonetheless, and they were, yeah, they were, everybody's seen the images of the people climbing up on scaffolding to write chalk these things up on the chalkboards at Caltech and, and right in, in NASA, where they, where they did all of that, that kind of modeling. Um, but the thing is that every stage, if you were to break out a piece of each of those models and ask the question of how do you know that, the answer would be, well, because we tested it in physical reality with this rocket or with this experiment in which we launched a projectile at this speed in that direction and through this air and through this, this medium, and we saw what happened. So we actually know these parameters are real in our model. That is not the case in the models of things like climate change, 
air pollution, uh, chemical exposures, medical, how, how drugs work, uh, how pharmaceuticals work in your, in your body. Uh, they're not the same kind of, as I said, that's deterministic modeling on the, the moonshot. And as it is, you had to ask, you, what you had to ask yourself, what a leap of faith the astronauts were taking, like trusting that model. Would they have gone there if they, if they went to the, so those scientists and said, how do you know that? And they said, well, what is this? What's this term up here in, your, in this black box in the middle of your, uh, your model here? And it's the, oh, that's the we believe it'll work like that box. That's 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 my that's why well, that's that's our assumed value. We we don't know that value. We haven't measured it, but we have reason to believe it. It works like that. I don't know, I'm not getting in that space capsule. I don't care how charismatic Elon Musk is. I'm not getting in that 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 capsule, right? Um, and, and I don't think anybody's saying is either. And somebody challenged me on Twitter saying, "Well, you know, airplanes are built on models." It's like, well, yeah, but I I don't know that anybody would have gotten in the very first model of an airplane given that most of them actually crashed, right? So I'd want to get in the incremental, after the incremental models, then, and you pinned all those things down by proving them, you know, then I might go for it. So um, anyway, so, so that's sort of the, the, the genesis of the plague of models uh, and why we still have this problem today. I mean, uh, and partly it's just because it's the, the, another perverse technology, I think, which is display technology. Um, right, we're looking at we're sitting here. We're looking at these displays, uh, and of course, your eyes tell you that there's some reality to them, as opposed to just photons bouncing, uh, hitting your retina, that are being generated by a, by um, circuits and LEDs in in, in your monitor. Um, but over time, the capability of making graphs and making visual displays has evolved tremendously, and humans are, are visual animals. We, we look at things and we absorb data visually, even subconsciously, very, very easily compared to working our way through the numbers and equations and even text explanations of things. And so I, I think that is part of the plague of models is the plague of, of uh, visualization, data visualization, uh, and how easily misled, uh, misleading it is when people see a graph that's going like this and they, they see a climate chart that seems to be chose this lovely sort of placid climate over the last 100,000 years, 20,000 years, and all of a sudden it goes shooting up like this, and they go, oh, my God, and it turns red. It goes from being this kind of comfortable-looking gray, and then it's kind of green. And you know, green, that's safe, and yellow, oh, that's caution. And then blasts into this red bar going up, and everybody goes, oh, my God, the world is going to burst into flames. We're all going to die, right? But that chart is inherently misleading because – it suggests there's some continuous series of data where people were taking measurements 20,000 years ago that were representative of something, the average temperature, the global average temperature, the re average temperature of New York, the average temperature of your house, something. And that some many scientists had pieced all those together in a coherent way to make this reflection of reality. And then they glommed on the actual readings from the last 150 years. We only started taking temperature readings around the 1800s, right? They glom that on as if it's one continuous series of events that are linked to each other by cause and effect, cause and effect. And it's not. It's, it's, it's inherently misleading. So I, I think that's another big component of the plague of models and why we've gotten where we are today. Very good. Uh, I was just going to read some quotes from Freeman Dyson on climate models. He's got a lot of good ones. Uh, one thing he said is those people don't look at observations. They are in a world of their own. The models are a very bad tool for predicting climate, and the scientists live by scaring the public. He also said that the models are very bad at describing the real world. The real world is full of things like clouds and vegetation and soil and dust, which the models describe very poorly. He also uh, quoted uh, von, John von Neumann, the father of climate Neumann. models, who said, <laughs> Uh, with four free parameters, I can fit an elephant. With five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. Do you have any thoughts on that stuff? I think those are great. Well, the, yeah, Van Neumann's quote is, class, is, a, is a classic, which is basically, um, if, if I have a line, if you have a line and you have, you, you, let's say it's got four points on it, and you can adjust one of them, you can make the line change, you know, you can change it from a straight line to a curve, 
Well, if you can adjust two of them, you can make it into a sine wave. You can lift one, drop the other. You can make it go like this. If you, or you can make it, make it. If you take the top two, you can move them flat and make it look like a plateau. You can, you can make, you can make it an elephant wiggle its trunk, right? As as I'm looking at that, um, and that's that's a fundamental truth of of that's called curve fitting. It's and it's it's one of the basis of. Um, it's 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 at the root of, of modeling. It's it's kind of related to data mining, which is you take your data and then you you search for a mathematical function that you draw a line you want to find, and then you find a mathematical equation to describe it, and then you assume that the, the equation actually is the reality of the data, right? As it describes data. Um, with regard to the, the Dyson on climate models, again, Dyson, brilliant man, um, uh, super brilliant, brilliant uh, physicist and uh, scientist. Um, he's right about the, 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 the problem with models. And, and the, the, the problem with models is, as I write in the, in the book, right? Models, people, have, people misunderstand the nature of a model. A model does not actually give you new information. A model actually is an abstraction of your data so that you can understand it, right? Um, and so you 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 have to, to, to actually simple model the climate, you actually have to extract only a few little components of it so that you can understand it, right? So you take things like average temperatures, average wind flows, average absorption of radiation by clouds and downward radiation, upward and outward radiation, um, they, they boil, the model is actually a distillation or a, a, an abstraction of a few parts of the system. But every time you do an abstraction of data, you lose information. It's like, a, a, the example given the in the book is, let's say you, you take a mouse and, and uh, you have a mouse. You have a mouse uh, in your hand, right? So in your hand, you're holding the mouse, and you, that mouse is the fullness of the data there is a, that, that exists about the mouse. If you take a picture of the mouse, which then is a model of the mouse, right, you're abstracting just the information about how light hits and bounces off the mouse. That's all you have in that picture. You don't have any of the remaining data about the mouse, what temperature it is, how much it weighs, the fact that it's going to the bathroom in your hand, which lab mice tend to do, um, it, that it might bite you, uh, right? what its behaviors are. You don't have any of that information in the model you've made of the mouse. And um, the same is with, true of, say, a, a wood cart. You're taking, a, you're taking a block of wood, you abstract the shape of, say, uh, a wood nymph or something out of the wood. But in doing that, you haven't created a new thing that is the nymph, you have removed all the, the knowledge of the wood other than that, right? Of the, of the, the data of the tree. So you've abstracted it. And climate models, because the climate is so complicated, that's what they do. They abstract a few values uh, on the assumption that those values are representative of the whole. Uh, mm -hmm. And they can't be, by definition, they, they can never be fully representative of the system. Um, but then it's even worse, which is the things they have picked they, that they pick out are not very well, in many cases, not very well understood. Uh, clouds are, are, are probably the thing that drives them the most insane. Um, uh, and it's, it's the one, it's, 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 it, ironically enough, it's the one area that, that has yielded remarkably little to, um, uh, to, to repeated studies. The, the IPCC, uh, really, when you when you read the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if you actually work your way through the science volumes, uh, you find that, that some uh, certain things are just intractable in terms of they haven't made much progress. Understanding how clouds work is one, narrowing the actual range of figuring out the range of climate sensitivity is how sensitive the climate is to greenhouse gases, is another. It keeps it keeps tweaking, uh, changing marginally, but it's much the same as it was in the 1800s when. Um, uh, Arrhenius, the first researcher, Dutch uh, scientist, first calculated it. You know, if we double the level of greenhouse gases, this is how much it'll warm. Uh, that range is still, they, they still haven't been able to narrow that range down. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the models, uh, the models are, are, well, they're what they are. They, they, they can look good. They can be attractive and convincing. As I discussed, my backdrop here is a model. Uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, behind me is a blank wall. Um, stucco wall. Um, but the, the models are actually not 
uh, not reality. And so, and the problem is, again, where I have, I don't have a problem with the models or modelers per se. I want, I want to say that, which is, look, I, I think they're probably fine, upstanding people. Many of them probably think they're doing, uh, they're, they're doing good work that, that can illuminate their subject in some way, if nothing else, by comparing model A to model B. And in some cases, comparing my model with how things work in reality and then making incremental projections with my model and seeing how they work. I'm sure they're, 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 they're fine people. The problem is those outputs of models are taken to be re reflections of reality that government is then using to make regulations which coerce people and which can land you in the pokey if you violate a regulation based on somebody's speculation that an action you're taking, your charcoal barbecue, is causing harm to other people conducted through these models of the relationship between its emissions and climate change and hurricanes hitting coastlines and hurting people, right? And so the, the government uses those model outputs to justify saying, uh, you, you don't get to have the charcoal barbecue, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But it has not been, it can't be conclusively shown that you're engaging in a harmful act when you're doing that. And, and that's, where my, that's where my sort of innate libertarianism comes in, which is I really don't believe the government has much, um, uh, it's a legitimate purpose of government to coerce people uh, whimsically uh, for, 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 uh, other than to stop them from harming each other. I really don't think it's it's the government's business to, that we should be telling people what to do, uh, and and forcing them to make changes in their life to their life, liberty, and and ha pursuit of happiness, as it were, without good cause. And models are not good cause. So you mentioned the IPCC, and I wanted to uh, say that you are looking at it from the perspective of an insider, right? You were an IPCC expert reviewer a while back, and you read it cover to cover back in the day, right? But would someone like you ever get to work on uh, AR7? Would they even uh, invite you to do that or no? Uh, no, generally speaking, so if, if uh, for, so for me, uh, to, uh, you know, full, full disclosure, I was an expert reviewer on the uh, third assessment report for the, the working group one volume, the science-based basis volume of the reports. Those reports are 1,500 pages long. They're, they're, they're three volumes. They're you know, impenetrable. And in fact, I did read the, the second assessment report cover to cover, uh, all three of the volumes, um, which was an act of, of stupendous masochism on my part. Uh, and I did it again for the fourth assessment, but the science volume and the fifth assessment and sixth assessment, um, the fifth AR5. Uh, I didn't read it. I haven't read AR6 cover to cover. Um, uh, and I actually mostly read AR5, the summaries. I didn't read all the paper. But I was an expert reviewer on, on uh, for, I think, the third assessment report. And um, also one on a special report on aviation and the global climate. But um, generally speaking, these are one and done sort of things. If you, uh, you, you get on and you're nominated to review and you're negative about it or you're critical about it, then uh, I don't know of anybody, this may be anecdotal, but I know of nobody, I know of quite a few people who were reviewers, but once. Um, you know, you don't tend to do it repeatedly. So, um, because you're, you're selected, you're not, you don't automatically qualify by virtue of having a particular degree or um, it's a political process of selection as to who gets to be a reviewer. You need a minimum, I mean, you need minimum qualifications in order to to, to uh, pass muster with it, with the powers that nominate you or propose you, but um, it's a political thing. So, and, and uh, it's unlikely I would get appointed again. Do you have any thoughts on where they're going to go with uh, AR7? Is it going to be more of the same or any more rational than the most the recent ones? Because they were more rational in the past, right? That long ago. Oh, well, actually, AR, 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 the, first, the first assessment report was very rational. It basically said, uh, to, here's what we know about, how the, about, about trends in the climate uh, and trends in, the, in um, and, then, and, and what we know is not very much. So please send more research grants. That was, I mean, that was like the first one. Um, and the second one was actually still pretty good, which is with our research grants from the first one, we've looked and now we know a bit more about how the weather climate has been evolving and how it seems to work. And, uh, but over time, they, that, that's, they got more and more into um, projections, more and more into modeling of prehistoric temperatures and projected future temperatures and then projected knock-on effects of changes in temperature 
and they they progressively became more and more and more and more exclusively about forecast modeling. Now they don't call it forecast modeling, and they don't call them predictions. They lots and lots of fine print. They call them projections of the future, uh, and they have uh, a a uh, huge uh, amount of of um, well baffled gab really about how they how how they assign confidence levels to what these things are. They they have this nomenclature which is. Uh, you know, we have high confidence that this prediction is correct. This projection is correct. We have medium conf medium to low confidence in this one. Uh, this is uh, highly certain. This is virtually, um, you know, virtually certain. Um, and so they have all these categories and then they assign them and say, we think it's 90 to 95% for virtually certain and it's 95 to 85 for certain and high confidence is that. And then you look in the fine print and you find out that the way they assign those values is they ask the original authors who submit their paper how confident they are. It's, it, that's it. It's not a mathematical thing. It's simply how confident are you that your work is right and reflects reality? And the, uh, the authors say, oh, I'm highly confident in that. And I'd say I'm about 85% confident in that. And boom, that's where it comes from. But it's, it's, you know, it's not actually a statistical test where somebody had run 100 tests and compared them with reality and got it right 95% of the time to the point that they say, yeah, 95% confident. No, it's, it's not that. It's completely subjective, really. I think it's amazing that there may be thousands of pages of IPCC reports, and they're all based on the idea that CO2 is the climate control knob. Because I'm just looking, I was looking at more Freeman Dyson uh, things that he said about modeling. And he was America's, or the uh, Einstein's successor, they called him. He's a highly decorated physicist. And here's a quote from him from 2011. I do not agree with the models that say the extra trapped heat exists. So he is at the very fundamental level, he's saying he's not even on board with that part of it. Yeah, well, the thing about physicists, I love them. And, and I, I have these discussions with my wife all the time. Um, uh, that sort of physics is the mother science. It's, it, it's, it's the foundation of all science. It describes the way the universe works. <clears throat> but physicists themselves can get a little esoteric for that for the common common purpose. So when a physicist says, "I don't believe heat is trapped," they're not saying it in the same way you and I might think so. They're saying if you look at the Earth from space, the energy in has to match the energy out. It has to be in balance. So, so right, you can't actually, um, you can't create an imbalance of the energy flow if you're if you're looking at it from a physics standpoint of a ball in space, uh, right? Planet in space, a radiative body that's taking radiation in and it's radiating, putting radiation back out, and has to be imbalanced and all that. Um, and I, I agree with them. I, I don't disagree with uh, – on general principles, I don't argue with physicists because they're better at math than I am. And um, uh, they're usually right uh, because, uh, you know, they, they prove their rightness every day in the sense that we're sitting on a computer, which you know, and, which is physics embodied. It's, it's electromagnetism, right, uh, embodied, and what is electromagnetism but physics? Uh, and so um, – you know, that's the thing about physics is it has to it proves itself every time you drop your cell phone right gravity gravity proves itself every single day and, and so uh, I don't argue with the physicists but uh, and and I but I agree with them that co2 is not the control knob there are which is not to say that if you have sunlight coming into the earth it's absorbed by the ground and plants and everything else some of it's re-radiated out as heat uh, right you experience this all the time when you radiation comes into your car it's absorbed by your steering wheel as heat, right? Put your hands on the wheel. I'm here in Las Vegas, did this yesterday, almost fried my hands, right? Uh, and it's radiating. You can put your hand near it and you can feel the heat radiating back out of the steering wheel. So you, we intuitively, we understand that, that that works. So, you know, if the sunlight comes into the earth and then it re-radiates out as heat, the gases around the, in the atmosphere, uh, do I believe that some of that heat is is slowed by its passage upward and out to space? I actually believe that. So I believe that part of the model of global warming, this greenhouse effect and global warming is real uh, in the sense that we have this layer of gases. If we stick molecules in it that are particularly inclined to grab block outgoing heat, 
then yeah, it'll hang that heat up for a while. We'll bounce back and forth in the atmosphere until it works its way up. <clears throat> not to not to use Al Gore's terribly flawed analogy of blankets, but there's some element grain of reality of truth to that, I think. Um, which is a far cry from saying that CO2, that greenhouse gases, or CO2 specifically, is the most powerful of those agents and is the <clears throat> control knob, the master knob uh, that controls the, the overall temperature of the atmosphere, um, and I, which I don't agree with. I, I think there's a large question in that. And <clears throat> one of the things I do, you know, I have a presentation I've given elsewhere, which I, I look at, I show the charts from the IPCC reports over time, in which they show the, their estimates of the different control knobs in, <clears throat> in the atmosphere that can work that, that particular trick. They can trap outgoing uh, photons or outgoing heat, hold it up for a little while, and then it's bounced back and forth to the surface, and then eventually it gets out. Right? CO2 is one of them. Methane uh, is another one, the, the major 97% constituent of natural gas. Methane um, uh, is another one. Nitrous oxide, uh, laughing gas, also uh, major uh, emission from fertilizer. The fertilizer breaks down, you release nitrous oxide. Uh, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, we think of the old geezers think of as the Freon, you put in your refrigerator and air conditioners, right? It's, um, there, there are chemicals that, that um, uh, are very chemically active, they can, they can compete. Um, but the uh, level of uncertainty as to how strong those individual things are and their concentrations are very different. And that has evolved over time. And there's a huge amount of uncertainty around them. And if you look at the IPCC reports, again, this is one of those things where those uncertainty bars don't go away very much for some of these factors. Um, but the IPCC talks about them less and less. And instead, they rely on the greenhouse gases are the thing. The well-mixed greenhouse gases are, the, are, the, the, are understood and known, and these other things are not known. But we don't think they're important enough to really change the overall focus on carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Right. So in your book, you mentioned something called the Federal Data Quality Act. Is that something that possibly can be used to uh, get uh, more re reality back into politics? Well, we, yeah, way back in ancient history um, in the 1990s, um, uh, there, was a date, there was a thing called the data, Federal Data Quality Act. Um, uh, I had tangential uh, interaction with one of the pioneers of that act, a congressman named Don Ritter, who was a scientist himself, physicist, I believe, um, turned politician. And he um, uh, was, was part, of the, part of the genesis of that. And it was an attempt to require um, that uh, regulations be based on um, hard science, that, 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 that the, the science be... Uh, inspected, accessible, transparent, uh, that data was available for reinspection and reanalysis, uh, that things could be verified and validated. Uh, and um, very quickly, uh, as is the case in these things in politics, when um, uh, power swung from one party to the other party, uh, the Data Quality Act, which was considered inconvenient to the left, to the Democrats, and people who wanted more regulations, uh, it was quickly uh, defanged uh, and rendered relatively um, uh, toothless uh, and has languished sort of as a vestigial toothless thing uh, ever since, um, much like the OIRA, the Office of uh, Regulatory Affairs, um, which has waxed and waned in its potency over administrations. But I, I think I, I think you know the idea of it could be resurrected, which is uh, again my 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 core focus is on what justifies regulation, what justifies a, a taking of government of people's life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, property, which is what regulations do. Um, what justifies that, and to the extent that people are claiming science is a justification and models are a justification, those things should be as accessible to inspection as evidence against you in a criminal trial, right? It, it is not enough for scientists to say, we came up with a study, but our data is classified because 
we don't think we can hide the people's identity well enough. So data patient privacy <clears throat> or our model is proprietary because we also use it to make money you know, for mining companies or for utility companies. We rent our models and, and right. And so we don't want to share the exact specifications of our models because they're proprietary to our laboratory. <coughs> um, and we won't turn over our code, our computer code that with which we run our models because that also is proprietary to us. And we have patented some of these mathematical techniques and our, our rate. And so it's proprietary. So we're not going to give out our models and we're not going to give out our raw data for reinspection and validation. And I think, and my, my answer to that would be, well, then it can't be used for regulation purposes. Your, your, those, those findings should not be introducible in your court of law as evidence against you if it can't be validated. And so some kind of a federal, uh, of a federal data um, quality act that says, if you are submitting science, uh, scientific papers or findings or output of models uh, to a regulatory proceeding, or some regulator wants to put them into a regulatory proceeding, they must be absolutely transparent from A to Z down to the finest grain detail of your handwritten lab notebooks that show exactly how many times you ran a model and it failed that you threw away before you got the one finding you published, that shows the raw data before you started taking averagings and, and deciding that that's an outlier, so I'm going to I'm going to tidy up my data, right? Trim my me, trim my extremes. Before that, all of that from the very first to the very end, soup to nuts, needs to be available, archived at the time of consideration of any of that information in a regulatory process. Before it, it should be ruled admissible in the court in the, the court of regulatory analysis, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would go a huge way uh, toward improving um, policy, it's grounding in reality and, and reducing the play, impact of the plague of models. All right. So with your permission, I'd like to read the four key takeaways from your book. Would that be all right? Uh, Absolutely. Fabulous stuff. So number one takeaway, uh, computer models of risks to environment, health, and safety are not reality, and they are not the science. Two, accepting models as reality for use by the government in coercing the public is bad. Ghostbusters level bad. Uh, three, the use of computer modeling as evidence in regulatory proceedings or any coercive process should be severely restricted. Four, embrace the power of calling humbug on speculative computer modeling. I think that's brilliant stuff. I think everybody should uh, should read those and uh, keep those in mind because there's that would solve so many of our problems if politicians would keep that stuff in mind, w wouldn't it? Yeah. It would, it would. It would. It would also. It would also tremendously reduce the size and scale of government and and regulation as well, which they might not like because <clears throat> it has become such a vast part of of the regulatory process, and its legitimacy is sitting rests on that. So, uh, it would it would make a world a much simpler world because the, the proliferation of rules and regulations that we see every year, thousands and thousands of pages in the Federal Register, right, and in in, in the legal codes would be thinned dramatically by that. And um, just one thing we didn't talk about, but one of the things, other things I, would, I, would say, uh, I speculated about is we should also put warning labels the same as we do on, they insist we do on cigarette packages. Those should go on charts and graphs that come out of computer modeling labs. There should be a big, bar, lab, a big label at the bottom that says, you know, warning. This is speculation based on assumption. It is not an extrapolation of measured reality. We did not measure reality and just say, we're making the one physics assumption that objects in motion remain in motion. And so 10 years from now, we would expect this line to be here. We're not doing that. These are assumptions. We're, we're, we're making assumptions and Molly was thinking, I think it's going to rate increase at a rate of, I think inflation is going to increase at a rate of only 0.01%. That's not the same as we measured it. And this is what it's doing. That's a model. And we need big, there should be big labels. And, you know, I think it's only fair that they should be at least half the size of the label, the same as they do for cigarettes. And with graphic, bold, red, scare ones, this is not, you know, no, warning, warning. Just, um, I think that would do a lot to help people understand the nature of the problem. 
But this is not just a niggling little thing that doesn't really matter, right? Because it's so much human misery, even in the last three years, it's been caused by this problem of thinking that models are reality, taking away farms in the Netherlands, uh, oh, killing off cattle, whatever, all this stuff. Look around your house. I mean, uh, so how, how, and, and how, so how many people realize their dishwasher doesn't work anymore? How, how many people realize that their dishwasher now, it takes two hours to do your dishes and they don't come clean? Where 20 years ago, it took 30 minutes at the most to wash your dishes from start to finish. You didn't scrape them. You didn't pre-rinse them. You threw them in the dishwasher. You pulled them out and they were clean. Why? Why? Because regulations to reduce energy use that are based on models which say energy use is bad were placed into law and the maker manufacturers of dishwashers were required to make them use less energy and less water. Therefore, they don't work very well. Your clothing washing machines are the same way. Your cars are, in many cases, are the same way. And they're going to get worse because, of course, they're forcing the move to electric vehicles, which will not perform anywhere close to what your, your uh, the Dodge Charger of my, the sainted Dodge Charger of my youth, hallowed my hallowed 1970 Dodge Charger. Um, your electric car is not going to beat that vehicle anytime soon. So it's really, it's, it's all around you. The, the, you're seeing the regular effects of regulation hemming you in, in the things you can and can't do every single year. They pile on more and more and more. And you see them in the costs as well. So that the, the new dishwasher, more expensive. The, the new energy efficient computer displays, they were more efficient. The new energy efficient um Computer circuitry, it's more expensive because being efficient is, is, is very expensive. And so you pay, you pay for it. You pay for it in money and you pay for it in lost capability over time, but it's incremental. And so people don't necessarily think, why doesn't it work anymore? Why, why, why hasn't this gotten better? Why, why, why have these technologies stopped getting better compared to the rate of increase when we were young? And it's because so much of the world is being hemmed in with regulation based on models that are, that are, are, are not substantial in reality. Uh, and and that that's the reason why we look around and think, why, why doesn't this work? Yeah, someone was saying that nature abhors a vacuum and the EU also abhors a vacuum because the uh, vacuum cleaners aren't working as well over there. Uh, like you said, so many things, washing machines, uh, lawnmowers. And there's this whole thing of making us uh, use ethanol in the U.S. I just have a lot of people talking about how their engines, it looks like they're uh, not working as well or maybe uh, not working at all because of the effects of ethanol in there. Yeah. Right. E ethanol, 10%, 10 ethanol, uh, 10 to 50, E15, E10, E15. Yeah, I, that's something that was one of the first things I wrote about. It was, was uh, the idea of using ethanol uh, as fuel. And again, it's one of those things where the reason was modeling, which originally was air pollution modeling. Most people don't, don't know this, right? But uh, in wintertime in California, you have a problem with carbon monoxide uh, building up in the air. Carbon monoxide is a deadly poison. It's the stuff that will kill you if you breathe, it used to kill you at least when you breathe tailpipe emissions in your garage or your car, idling car or truck. When you had a, a leak in your exhaust manifold, it could kill you. Um, and so they, they would add ethanol because it would reduce carbon monoxide uh, emissions. So, so he added it to winter gas in California. Um, but then it became an idea that, that, well, if it's good for reducing carbon monoxide emissions, it might be good for reducing other emissions as well. And, and in fact, that it's, it's theoretically would reduce CO2 emissions because it's carbon neutral, right? That is the Photosynthesis, the sun comes in, plants make sugar, sugar makes ethanol, you burn the ethanol, you release the carbon, it goes back up, comes back down, and therefore it's, it's renewable. And so then th that's when it became mandated for use in gasoline uh, to conserve energy and to conserve, to reduce oil consumption after the 1970s uh, Arab oil embargo, right? Uh, and that's when I first got interested in it when I was a kid pushing my car to the gas station uh, in the gas lines in the 70s. I took an interest in actually, I lived in the valley, as I said. The valley was originally an orange grove. We were surrounded by giant orange trees that nobody was eating the oranges from. And I thought, you know, I could make those oranges into alcohol and I could burn the alcohol on my car. Instead of waiting here in line for the gas station, I, I would distill my own 
uh, my own ethanol and put it in my car, my own hooch. Right, I put my moonshine in my in my car, and I'd be I'd be I'd be good to go. Um, I I even uh, got in the instructions how to build a, a, a solar powered still uh, and the forms to fill out for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Uh, but uh, being only 13 at the time, I was not qualified to get a license to distill alcohol. And so regulations killed my, my budding entrepreneurialism because I would have been like way, way ahead of the curve. Super pioneer in fuel ethanol. That would have been me. It would, your car would have my patent in it. But there you go. So uh, how are the levels of actual air pollution in California right now versus in the 1970s? Oh, I, 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 or they're, they're orders of magnitude better. I mean, it literally, it's one of the things where the, the, the thing is, wait, wait, there are these processes that, that result in people thinking that pollution is still bad, when in fact, the measured concentrations of stuff in the air are declining over, have been declining precipitously. 80, 90% from car emissions, the, the, the emissions have gone down tremendously. Um, and yet people still think they're bad because the definitions used by government to trigger smog alerts have gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. And so the government keeps saying, oh, my God, we're having a smog day, a smog day even though the concentration is one-tenth of what it was when they first started calling them smog days. So people perceive or believe that the air is bad because they don't look out the window, except occasionally when you have fire seasons. And then people are told to think to are persuaded to to conflate smoke in the air with pollution, regular air pollution. And of course, they're, they're not the same uh, same thing. So the pollution levels in Los Angeles are vastly better now. To this day, you'll go to the San Fernando Valley. You'll come from Hollywood if you survive. You'll come over the Santa Monica Mountains uh, to go drive down into the San Fernando Valley in the summertime. You'll see before you a unattractive layer of gray smog, uh, haze. Uh, and you, it's, it's, you're, you're like an intrepid submarine pet captain about to submerge yourself below that layer to get into, this, into the San Fernando Valley. Um, but uh, even that layer is, is much uh, thinner and less, uh, actually less toxic than it was. It, it was dark brown. I was a youth, uh, but it wasn't actually fluorescent colored because of the the chemical pollutants in the air uh, from chroming operations and things like that. You didn't have technicolored rainbow layers. Now you have just kind of gray. But that's because the, the, the San Fernando Valley is a bowl and the air pressure comes, the air pressure comes down, compresses the air. And so you get pollution that's natural that gets built up. Which brings us to Ronald Reagan, who, um, uh, as you said, I see behind you in your backdrop, uh, you have a lot of trees out there. Uh, Ronald Reagan pointed out that, uh, in fact, a large part of the pollution in California and the reason they still have it now is because it's produced by uh, trees. Trees make chemicals called volatile organic compounds, carbon compounds, VOCs. And here's today's, here's, here's today's chemistry lesson, right? As one of my chemistry professors said, uh, what's a VOC? Well, if you can smell it, it's probably a volatile organic carbon compound. So they, the things you, can you smell the trees? Though the, what you're smelling when you smell the trees and orange blossoms uh, are volatile organic chemical carbon compounds being released uh, into the air. That's the smell of a fruit. That's the smell of your coffee. That's the smell of most things. And those VOCs, when they go up into the air, interact with sunlight and they make ozone. They make smog. Um, and so, uh, that's why the valley was the, the Indian Native Americans called it the Valley of Smoke. Uh, the Smoky Mountains are wreathed in smog. Why? Trees, sunlight, uh, some some decomposition nitrogen oxides from decomposing foliage, and you get a baseline background level of smog. There's today's photochemistry lesson. Um, <laughs> for for your view, your viewers, but and, and they're a bit of chemical trivia, which is that banana oil and all the perfumes. When 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 we, when so when your environmental activist kid comes and says, "Oh my God, we have to stop these VOCs and these ozone forming chemicals from being emitted," it's like, you know, everything in your bathroom that smells, chuck it. If you can smell it, VOCs. 
Very interesting. Um, what do you think? You've been looking at this whole picture of environmentalism for what, 25 plus years? Oh, well, yeah, since 1992. Uh, do you do you think we passed a peak green or peak at least climate alarmism now, or what do you think? It seems to me like we might have hit the peak. I'll be surprised if it gets worse than this from here. I think I think we, uh, yeah, I think we've hit uh, several several kinds of peaks. Uh, uh, one is I think we've hit the peak of deception uh, in the in the sense that I've, I've always had conflict. This is actually would have been one of my few acts of faith, right? I guess we could say if I had any acts of faith. I've always believed that at a certain point, people would look outside and they would see the disjunction between what their eyes are telling them and what the scientists or government is telling them, right? Environmentalists are telling them. And I think we're reaching that level where people in Los Angeles, places like that, are just, they're looking around themselves and they're reading the headline that says, the, the, the environment is being utterly destroyed. We're, we're, it's an arm again. There will be no ice in the, on the world in, in five years. Or in this. And they, they've reached a point where they've had enough cycles of, I read that prediction, and then I look outside and it's like, hmm, it's snowing again. I lived in Canada for 10 years, so believe me. Right? Everybody, they'd say the winter, winters will be almost non-existent in like 10 years. And every Canadian's going, praise God. So that, that's one peak, which is the, simply the believability peak, I think, is being reached. Um, and another is a, a, a peak of, of uh, belief in good intentions. I think people have become, uh, have, have come to understand that the, these, uh, many cases, the environmentalists and pushers of risk reduction, of health risk reduction and anything like that, uh, they are not your friend and they are not well-intended. And the, there have been, again, enough cycles of, of people seeing that to know. So the environmentalists say, we care about the Mojave Desert. They chased my mother and I out of our camping days in the Mojave Desert. We had a mining claim, actually. They chased us out of the, that to protect the desert tortoise. Because we believe tortoises are vital to the ecosystem, the ecosystem is sacred to and to the benefit of all man, of, of humanity. It provides vital services. And what do they do 15 years later? They put giant solar farms up. They actually bring out lawnmowers and carve the cactus down in half that will take them hundreds of years to regrow if they live. They pick up the tortoises, they relocate them, even though that makes them, again, to get biologically gross. They pee when you move them. That amount of water alone is enough to kill them. They become dehydrated and they never, they never catch up, so they die. Um, and so people have seen enough cycles of, we have to protect the environment. So let's put out these things that destroy the environment to realize there's a lack of sincerity. So I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's peak gullibility that we're seeing um, I, I'm people, um, and maybe even peak cynicism, uh, now especially, I think, with COVID. Uh, I think you saw a, um, uh, for at least for you know, fully half the population, I think you saw a leap toward climate change wasn't enough, uh, and that, that it was moving the dial that way. People were basically getting more and more cynical in terms of believing the people of science, not the science, the people. And I, I think we maybe have reached really peak cynicism on that, uh, and maybe even excessive cynicism, but, but that's the consequence of going overboard with um, the false predictions. It's, you know, you do the boy who cried wolf thing, nobody believes you. So, so I, I, think, I think we may have, we may have hit a peak on, on, on a lot of those things, but um, you know, unfortunately, as one of my my early physics teachers uh, was a big debunker of of uh, he was he was uh, George A. Bell was his name George O. A. Bell he was an astrophysicist they named galactic clustering after him, um, but he was a huge uh, debunker of psychics in the 1970s. He was a sort of a uh, one of these people like, like the amazing Randy who went after Yuri Geller and psychics who were claiming they had supernatural powers. Um, but as he pointed out, you know, people are innately gullible for soothsayers. It has always been, uh, it's always been a problem. It's easier to convince people and fool people than it is to prove uh, to people that they're being fooled. And so, you know, I, I'd like to think we've reached um, a peak on these things. And back to the IPCC, I, I, I think it's possible that the IPCC will not even do a seventh assessment report. Um, because I think they're tired of, uh, first of all, they're, they're, they're sort of backing away. Recently, most recently, they said, um, 
those high end scenarios that that of of seven degrees of warming, five degrees of warming, um, those are not plausible, and those really never were plausible, and we're not going to even talk about those anymore. And mo even more recently than that, th th there was a basically a report that came out from the IPCC, I believe it was, uh, that said you know that one point five degree C uh, target that uh, that th that will that indicates like. Uh, critical damage to the to the climate that we have to stop. Well, it's really not that damaging. So um, I think they're they're mo they're moderating their position, um, and I think they're also um, perhaps tired of of seeing people dig into their reports and say, uh, "But hey, look, the IPCC is not alarmist on this." They're, 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 if you look into the detailed body of the report. Fires being an example I've written re recently about the forest fires in North America. Uh, if you look in the report on the IPCC, they basically say we have we have some weak evidence that there has been an increase in fire weather, some unstated places around the Earth because of climate change. That's it. That's the extent of their alarmism about climate change is causing fires. But what do you hear on your in, in your evening news forecast? Global warming, unmitigated, un unpermitted, unprecedented levels of global warming are causing North America to burst into flames. Well, but there's no evidence of that. And the IPCC says there's no evidence of that. And it supposedly is the world's body of most authoritative science, as evaluated by the most authoritative scientists. They say, no, we, we, there's some evidence that in a warmer world, you'll have a little more fire weather some places. But that's about the best we can say. And you know, I think I think that's being used um, against them. So I have a feeling that the environmental community would rather the IPCC basically quietly fold in its doors uh, rather than than move forward. So I think they may lose support that way. But that's all speculation. Okay, this has been really good. Here, We're coming up on an hour. Do you have any other points you'd like to make before we finish up? Um, no, other than a completely self-interested plug, uh, that's the, my virtual cover of my virtual of my book behind me. You can get it at uh, Barnes and Noble if you're into old-fashioned print. You can get it on Google Play Books um, for uh, if you want the, the digital version or through the publisher Fullerene Press. It's a small Canadian imprint that f focuses on specifically on science and policy uh, books, which are writing science and public policy. Um, so unfortunately, you can't get it through Amazon for some reason. Uh, along with other people who have written contrary things about COVID and policy and climate policy, Amazon uh, chose not to publish my book, uh, but um, uh, they won't tell us why. Just uh, we just gotta know. But so you can't get it there. But um, uh, the version on Google Play Books is just as good and maybe even more flexible because it takes you out of the Amazon walled garden and lets you read it wherever the heck you want. So. Uh, buy the book, and uh, you can drop me a note through Tom, or you can you can look me up. I'm on Twitter. Um, uh, so uh, Kenneth P. Green is my my uh, handle at at enviro.kg, I believe it is. Um, and if you want to find me, um, I also do a lot of work for the Fraser Institute in Canada, which is www.fraserinstitute f r a s c -E r institute dot uh, org. It's a Canadian think tank. It's their sort of the their heritage or the conservative think tank of Canada. They're for economic freedom and uh, generally uh, they they lean. They won't say this, but they they're the market. They're they're they, they're pro market essentially. Um, and I do a lot of work through them, so you can find me there. Um, and uh, yeah, otherwise, um, look me up, drop me a note, read the book if you have questions. I'd love to love to see you post people post reviews. So that's a, that's a big hit. If you do get the book, please feel free to post a review somewhere. I write a review. I uh, appreciate it. Well, my, um, my mind is blown. I thought you chose not to have it on Amazon. Somebody at Amazon said, "No, we're not going to publish this." The yeah. algorithms, and I, nobody, I don't, no, nobody actually saw it. it the rejection happened almost within that. Within we put it up, they posted it, and then it was pot pulled back down by on autopilot with a form letter. Wow! Because I've been through it. What's in there? What what one thing do you think? It's all the data, and there, there's nothing in there that any sane person would say you can't publish this. But it happened, huh? yeah. Yeah, well, it happened, and like, like I said, I mean, it has happened to other people. Alex Berenson, who is a well-known writer on risk for the New York Times, his book, his uh, book on COVID was uh, rejected. Same basic idea, which is don't talk about COVID. Um, others with uh, who are climate skeptics have had their works rejected uh, as well. 
like I said, I, I can't say that it's, it's a conspiracy. I don't think it was any person who looked at it and said, you know, we're not going to publish this because it's it, it's skeptical. Um, but I think they, I think their algorithm basically says, you know, uh, if this is going to to uh, get people angry at, at certain phrases, then they reject you. Okay. Anyway, that's a great reason for us to buy it. I, I did buy it on Google Play. Show so. Amazon what for. There you go. All right. Don't let them limit your choices. All right. A lot. All right. On that note, I will let you go. But thank you very much for taking the time. And I hope to have you on again in the future. Thank you, Tom. Anytime. Anytime. All right. Talk to you next time.